Most campaigns start with an objective and then try and find a path to the objective. CFD was different. It started with a path, but there was no idea of what lay at the end of the path, just the knowledge that there would be something that was much better than the politics we have today. While it was clear that much could be achieved, there was a problem. The way forward was only open at general elections, when neither of the two main political parties in the UK, Labour and the Conservatives, had a large lead. It wouldn't work if one of those parties had an unusually large lead, as Labour does now. However, as you will have seen in the second video in this series, other routes to our objective, a democracy that works and works well, are now open. The original idea was to get floating voters in marginal seats to demand something in return for those crucial votes. It might seem strange, but that idea didn't come out of an interest in politics. It came out of an interest in history. A small part of that interest was a question at the back of my mind about how power came to be concentrated in Parliament. This was no great search for truth. I was just curious as to how this came about. Browsing through the shelves of a bookshop over 25 years ago, I came across this little second-hand book, A History of the English Parliament. I bought it and eventually got round to reading it. The book told how British monarchs have at times had a lot of power, but never enjoyed absolute power, and they've not usually been able to just help themselves to other people's money. For hundreds of years, when they've needed extra cash, they've usually had to ask Parliament for it. They've had to ask for what was called the grant of supply, the supply being money. Parliament's response to this request for a grant of supply has sometimes been to ask the monarch for something in return, what was called the redress of grievances. History tells us that he who has the money usually has the upper hand, and to cut a long story short, and to grossly oversimplify the situation, as the years passed, money won, and Parliament ended up with all the money and all the power. What was clear to me was that it was a deal. Parliament had something the monarch wanted, and there was a price to pay, a slow but steady transfer of power, because when it came to money, Parliament had the upper hand. When I realised that, I made the connection between the power Parliament had over the monarch and the power that floating voters in marginal seats had over politicians. I knew that elections could be close and that the result could be decided by a small number of floating voters in marginal seats. On election days, they had the politicians over a barrel. If they were to demand something in return for their votes, any party that wanted to win that election would have to give them what they wanted and do it quickly, or risk allowing their opponents to step in first and win. At that instant, I understood the potential. I didn't know what the demand should be at that time, just that something extraordinary could be done, if I could get the demand right. A couple of things were immediately obvious. The demand would have to be something that almost everyone could unite behind, and that meant it could have nothing to do with policy. For example, a demand for more money for the health service would degenerate into arguments about how much should be demanded, what it should be spent on, and whether or not what was being spent was being spent well. Anything along those lines was a matter of policy, and policy divides, so anything to do with policy was off the table. That left matters of fundamental principle, and that took me to the idea of demands to reform the political system. But again, I hit the policy problem. If we did demand something like proportional representation, some people would agree with this, others would not. But it was clear that things weren't working, and that many of the problems we faced were the product of the system. Everyone knew things needed to change, but deciding what changes should take place would lead to endless argument. This led to the conclusion that the demand should be for a process that allowed change to happen. We could all agree that we needed change, we would leave the arguments about what needed to change until after the process had been put in place. I'd found a demand that made sense and people could support. It was a good start, but there were a few more problems to solve. The first was to make sure the process couldn't be abused. There are plenty of people out there looking to impose their way of doing things on the rest of us. So the first protection was to ensure that no change could take place unless it went through a democratic process, either through Parliament or through the use of referendums. The use of an initiative and referendum system was crucial. Unless people could initiate referendums on reform, then Parliament would veto any meaningful change, and that meant there would be no change. 
Another problem is that reforming the political system is not enough on its own. What needs to be tackled are the influences on the system, and so the demand was expanded to cover this. There was one last big problem to be addressed. If we were to be allowed to initiate referendums on reforming the political system, sooner or later people would be demanding the ability to hold referendums on anything, and using the reform system to push that change forward. The introduction of a system that allows people to initiate referendums without having to ask the permission of politicians is a transfer of sovereignty, of real power. That's a huge change, but did there need to be anything dramatic about it? The day after these changes had been introduced, in the real world, nothing would have changed. The lights would still be on, the bills would still have to be paid, and the trains would still be late. The only change that would have taken place is that our rather archaic and dysfunctional political system could be made to work, a very positive change, and that change could only come about through democratic processes, either through our various parliaments or through the use of referendums. Having worked out what the demand should be, it was now apparent that the demand could not be changed. As soon as the campaign and its system became public knowledge, the demand would have to be set in stone. Once people had started to support the project, a deal had been made with them, their support in return for this system. There could be no negotiations with politicians about changing the demand or watering anything down. The most the politicians could be offered were two choices. Unconditional surrender, or if that was too much for them, they could surrender unconditionally.